Bojana Videkanić. She's an art historian and an artist born in Bosnia and Herzegovina in former Yugoslavia. Uh, after becoming a stateless person, she came to Canada as a government-sponsored refugee in 1995. She's teaching contemporary art and visual culture. And her book, uh, Non-Aligned Modernism, Socialist Post-Colonial Practices in Yugoslavia from 1945 to 1985 was published by McGill Queens University Press. Boana, if you want to add something about yourself, please do. I give floor to you. And then just for information, we are now also on YouTube. You can share your screen. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the introduction. I hope you can see, uh, you can see my screen now. Um, I'm going to start my presentation. Um, oops. Just a second. All right, I'm gonna start it this way and hopefully I'll be able to see what I'm doing because uh, I forgot to minimize my, Never mind. I'll just start. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Ksenia, for the introduction. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, Paul, for organizing this workshop. Um, and also thank you to all of the colleagues uh, who have been presenting their work in the past two days. Um, I had to change my setting because uh, there's some noise around my house, so I'm in a different room. Um, this, this, was, this has been an excellent lineup of ideas and polemics around Yugoslavia and its relationship to Non-Aligned. Um, the discussions were really invigorating and gave me a lot of pause and um, lots to think about. Um, I would like to also thank, um, and this is a more kind of a historically uh, uh, looking uh, thank, thank you note to all of the revolutionary Yugoslavs who fought for ideas and practices that we are uh, discussing here. Um, so I think that that, that, that um, standing on the shoulders of those who came before is very important uh, for me uh, in particular. So um, my presentation today deals with the new trajectory in my research, which has roots in my recent book, Non-Aligned Modernism, that Xenia uh, mentioned, um, in which I outline and define Yugoslavia's alternative modernist artistic forms, linking them to the building of the non-aligned movement after World War II. In the book, I define non-aligned modernism as a synthesis of influences from autochton, indigenous or local, if you will, Yugoslav artistic traditions, nascent aesthetic traditions and networks of the global south, and the already existing in many ways hegemonically imposed Western modernist structures. Um, Non-aligned modernism was inescapably interlinked with politics of the non-aligned as the political, social, and economic structure, uh, which shaped artists' responses to both formal and conceptual demands of artistic production and politics that, that, that has shaped their lives in a material sense, um, and as they themselves also shaped politics. Um, so while the book began to situate Yugoslav 20th century art within this constellation of global modernisms, the new research that I'm embarking upon seeks to explore Yugoslav art from a more comparative uh, perspective uh, to non-Western artistic histories, especially as they are related to non-aligned artistic um, uh, histories, and thereby um, I'm seeking to further decouple Yugoslav art from its perceived, sub perceived subservience to canonical models of the, West, of the West. My research also seeks to challenge the kinds of uh, productions, knowledge productions, that read non-aligned art Yugoslav engaged art, uh, political art, as opportunistic, as totalitarian, propagandistic, uh, or simplistic, or, or apolitical in a worse kind of uh, the sense of the word of apolitical. So today I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get to through these five points that I'm making around this new research that kind of connects the previous research and what I'm trying to do. Um, so I'm going to try to go through these through my presentation. Uh, so number one is turning modernism on its head. And number two is establishing long durée, what I call long durée, 
of um, non-aligned modernism between Zemlya uh, or Earth Group and non-aligned modernism. So um, figuring continuities of Yugoslav engaged art um, throughout the 20th century. Number three, um, establishing links between socialist realism and political and cultural independence in Yugoslavia. Um, and then linking that in point number four to comparative networks, uh, meaning alternative global networks, which sought, all of them sought to decenter hegemony of Western modernism. And finally, think about a question perhaps um, that I'm thinking myself as to who are, who were the Yugoslav vanguards? Um, Yugoslav vanguards in terms of art and culture. Um, so these two, um, two of the possible vanguards are in this slide, uh, Anton Augustinčić and Franjo Mraz, who have, whose work has very much shaped my thinking um, and is in the background of all of this work that I'm doing. So let me start by thinking about turning modernism on its head. Um, in my research, I'm really interested in how one turns modernism on its head. Um, the research that I've been doing both in my book and continue to do with this paper challenges the idea that Western art represented the epicenter of modernism by uncovering a system or what I term transnational solidarities that were established by artists, intellectuals and arts managers of the second and third worlds. More specifically, I look at the exceptional role that the cultural diplomacy of the socialist Yugoslavia played in this process by examining Yugoslavia's championing of various forms of modernist art, including socialist realism. I, in doing so, the project situates Yugoslav modernism within the global modernist ethos. This study therefore intervenes and sheds new light on an underrepresented and under-researched history of modernism and on intellectual and theoretical connections and cultural collaborations between Yugoslavia and countries of Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, and Latin America. The rich history of international cultural diplomacy that we've been all um, thinking about in these past few days um, in the late 20th century, these centers the dominant position of Western art and culture, establishing a new understanding of artistic work on the countries that tend to be perceived as existing on the periphery. So in doing so, I'm intervening both in Yugoslav art history that has for several decades criticized and in some ways rejected these particular types uh, of artwork that I'm gonna be talking about, especially politically engaged partisan art um, as an often dubbed it propaganda. Um, while such criticism against Yugoslav art have been leveled since the uh, at least 1970s, it is particularly after the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s that we see the full rejection of this. And number two, um, I'm also seeking to um, intervene into global uh, modernist art, or I'm seeking to insert Yugoslavia into the global uh, modern art. Um, and this art has largely been dominated by, by particular canonical discourses around what modernism was and how it developed. And this, in this way, this reacher challenges the idea that Yugoslav art was subservient to hegemonical Western modernism and pays instead attention to what uh, um, Croatian uh, writer um, Krle, Miroslav Krleža has called Yugoslav autochton, local artistic tra tradition, linking it to similar ideas in the non-Western world and especially in the member states of the non-aligned movement. So here, uh, I wanna just point out two of these examples that I'm using. On the left side, you see the work by uh, a drawing, ink drawing by Joaquin Torres Garcia, who was an Uruguayan uh, neoconceptualist, uh, sorry, neoconstructivist artist, who in 1943 comes back to live in Uruguay, his native Uruguay from Paris. And when he arrives to Uruguay, he creates this map in which he literally turns the map of uh, Latin America on its head so that what is perceived to be the, the, the center, what is perceived to be above, which is United States and Canada, is now turned on its head. And Uruguay that is marked here by its uh, geographical location and, um, and, and an X uh, represents the center of the world. And in many ways, this uh, simple drawing um, establishes a kind of an intent by periphery, by artists existing in periphery um, to turn modernism. On the right side is a, a, a small drawing in a, in a series of drawings that were created by Croatian artist William Svechniak, who um, was uh, after reading 
uh, Miroslav Krlažo's Balade Petrice Kerempuha creates this as a response to what Krlaža did in a literary form. And what he did was to also crit critique uh, Western uh, modernism, to critique Western history. And Ville Svechniak calls this uh, quite, uh, quite a challenging and perhaps even scandalous drawing, uh, Circus Europe. Um, of course, poking fun at uh, European civilization. So already in um, 1920s, we see these moves towards post-colonial thinking. So this, is, this brings me to the second point that I'm trying to make, which is the long durees of, uh, of, of Yugoslav engaged art. So Yugoslav artists, cultural workers, writers, politicians, um, were involved in pre-World War debates around socially engaged art and social realism, and they were trying to extricate uh, themselves both from Soviet Union, but also uh, from the West, and that led directly to the NAM. So uh, this is an example from uh, the famous, uh, um, famous uh, series of, uh, of uh, short stories by Miroslav Krleža, Hrvatski Bog Mars, in which he already in 1922 uh, tells us about this idea of uh, post-colonial thinking within Yugoslav, um, Yugoslav uh, artistic expression. Um, that, that expression continues into the work of uh, Zemlya or Earth Group, um, where uh, Krleža actually uh, was quite influential for them, where we see artists like Krsto Hegedušić, Ivan Geralić, uh, who are already, again, um, engaging very political, very clearly socialist, um, and very clearly engaged work. This continues into the uh, World War II, and uh, those who were part and parcel of Zemlya uh, and, uh, and engaged art before World War, II, uh, World War II are now also engaged in, uh, in the fighting during the war. I note in my text that uh, one third of Yugoslav artists were actually fighting in the partisans. Um, so socialist realism um, was, was the form the artistic form of cultural independence. And this is where I also question the very uh, criticism of socialist realism. Um, so the, the work of politically engaged artists from World War II continues in the war and serves as a base for cultural diplomacy and creation of alternative networks later on in the non-aligned. It challenges the long-standing discourses around realist and political art in Yugoslavia as being regressive, simply prop propagandistic or kitsch. What was seen as socialist realism between 1920s and 30s in Yugoslavia was never really realism as it was uh, debated, especially in the West and theorized. Instead, Yugoslav artists showed time and time again an adherence to a different mode of realism that came from specific political context of the region. And this is exactly the point that I'm trying to make, which was really important for what NAM artists will do and what realism also will be in engaged political art in non-aligned countries, especially revolutionary countries such as, you know, um, um, Nigeria or um, Mozambique and others. Um, so comparative networks. I'm also trying to make a direct comparisons, not between Yugoslav, Yugoslav socialist uh, art or art in socialism, engaged art and uh, European models, but between uh, Yugoslav art and non-European models. So the clearest and most obvious link, of course, is between Yugoslav uh, engaged artists and uh, Mexican muralists. Um, so those political links are very, very uh, clear. Um, in 1952, um, um, Miroslav Krleža writes one of the most uh, important texts um, that are outside of his literary, genre, uh, literary writing about uh, socialist uh, realism and realism, or autochthone realism, in fact, where he um, rejects Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union's art, and rejects modernist art, and calls for something third or in between, and says in his, in this text uh, that I quote here: Kandinsky was pointless already in 1913, especially from our perspective of Balkan wars and dissolving of the Austrian Empire. That Gerasimov and Zhdanov's right-leaning artistic contra-revolutionary work together with the idealist theoretical leaning of Todor Pavlov cannot be of help here is beyond doubt. Once a socialist cultural medium conscious of its rich past 
and its cultural mission is contemporary uh, in contemporary European space and time is developed, our art will inevitably appear. So of course, art that was already doing this is the work of the so-called naive artists, and I don't like using this term, um, and engaged, politically engaged artists like uh, Marian de Toni and Krzysztof Hege Dusic. Um, direct link to this, of course, only uh, um, in the same, around the same time, is the work of the, the Bombay Progressive Artist Group that was influenced by the 1935 publication of the Manifesto of the Indian Progressive Writers Association, in which they state almost identical thing to Krleža, um, and that the object of Indian uh, art is the, uh, of the association is to rec rescue literature and other arts from the priestly, academic, and decadent classes in whose hands they have degenerated for so long to bring the arts in the cl uh, closest touch with the people, to make them vital organs which will reg uh, register the actualities of life. We believe that the new literature of India must deal with basic problems of our existence today. This is exactly what Yugoslav artists were also saying at, at the same time, which also explains why it was so easy later on to make these links uh, between the non-aligned uh, cultural networks. Uh, similar thing we see with the work of Uche Okeke, who in uh, 1960, uh, just at the dawn of uh, Nigerian independence, uh, um, uh, creates his uh, manifesto of natural synthesis in which he rejects European art, but also uh, calls for a kind of indigenous mixture, hybrid art between indigenous art that's based in African traditions and European artists. Um, and of course, that art should reflect the everyday of Nigeria. Um, and this is very uh, important and he calls for a uniquely Nigerian modernism. So these comparative networks of meaning are very, very important as to how Yugoslav artists will be presented to the world later on in the non-aligned. Um, and again, a very, another really interesting example is between, um, in between Macedonian artist Borko Lazeski, who was influenced by Mexican muralist and who in 1956 created this enormous mural about the, no, uh, about the national liberation um, in Yugoslavia at the train station in Skopje, which is 45 meters long. Um, and this enormous monumental work was an homage also to Mexican muralists. Later on, really interestingly, in 1985, he's invited into Technical Museum of Mexico City to create a, muse uh, a mural for peace. And he does create this, uh, again, very, very large museum that very much echoes uh, Mexican muralism. So what I'm trying to say here is that this, what we call and what uh, Yugoslav art history, especially in the 90s has called socialist realism uh, needs to be decoupled from ideologically driven decades long criticism leveled at it. And we need to broaden it up and connect it to the ways in which this was uh, created in the rest of the world and how it echoes these different uh, practices. So what were the comparative networks? So, I would like to then uh, use two examples very quickly. Um, one, of, one example is an exhibition that was organized in Slovenia in, in Slovenia in 1966. Um, the idea of the exhibition came from um, um, after the, uh, 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 this um, uh, gallery was built in 1966 and the inaugural exhibition was this exhibition called peace, humanity, and friendship amongst people. Um, the idea for the exhibition came from the uh, National Yugoslav Organization, Youth Organization for the United Nations. Um, the interesting part of this is that the, 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 the town itself had only 4,000 uh, 4, people in it. Um, and they managed to organize this enormous exhibition with almost 250 artists from all over the world, including artists who were uh, non-traditionally or non-academically trained, uh, naive artists, politically engaged artists, and people who were uh, sort of very well-known uh, abstract expressionists, modernists, and even conceptual artists uh, from all over, as I said. So uh, the work ranged from uh, more sort of traditional realist approaches uh, to um, to different themes. 
um, to these more um, engaged works and works that were sort of semi-abstract, such as Amelia Pelez, who was a Cuban uh, artist, uh, Gomez Adolf, Adolfo Quinqueros, who was a Mexican artist, and Re uh, Porta Carrero, who was a Cuban artist, revolutionary, and was actually um, in many ways connected to uh, the political and institutional development of art in um, in um, Cuba. Um, two artists who came from the Middle East, such as Akras Gayas, who was a Syrian artist, and artists from Africa, like Charles Mwenze and Mongolo, who, uh, who was from Congo. So this exhibition really opened up uh, the door uh, and, and showcases what the Yugoslav um, non-aligned policy was about. Uh, and how it was um, enacted in the cultural exchange way. The second example that I would like to put forward is this um, um, exhibition that was created in 1975. It was uh, created for Algeria, so it really nicely ties back into Mila's work. This was organized uh, through the cultural exchange uh, contracts between Yugoslavia and Al Algeria. And uh, the Yugoslav side has paid for all of the travel costs, installation costs and everything to send this exhibition there because the Algerian side asked for it. Um, and it was basically an exhibition of Yugoslav people's army in fight against fascism. It had about uh, almost 100 works of art by various uh, artists in various generations. And um, it was fully dedicated to showcasing, um, to showcasing the um, uh, World War II and the partisan struggle um, in, um, in World War II that these artists uh, were um, enacting. So what these, sh what these uh, examples show us, what they signal is that the non-aligned cultural workers to counter what Tren Van Ding, the Vietnamese, um, 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 Vietnamese uh, diplomat called cultural imperialism was to create their own networks. And this is what I also argue in my book. In order to do this, I pay attention to artists whose work I, uh, I've already mentioned um, and who are very deliberately questioning this Western hegemony of art. These artists, the former members of Zemlya Group, the partisans, the political, uh, the political. Uh, Diana, I'm I'm sorry, I'm seeing Ksenia's trying to interrupt you, but she's she's oh, still oh, muted. Uh, you're, okay. you're, you're you're way over time. All right, so yes. I'm just gonna. Thank it, you, it's the end. It's it's the end of my presentation, anyway. So I just wanted to kind of uh, I, I I can uh, address the final fifth point if people ask, but I'm at the end. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Yes, I was trying to interrupt, but then I was like thinking also to give you a bit more time uh, because it was very interesting. Thank you very much, Boena. And now I uh, will ask Natasha Kovacevic to give her comments and reflection. But also since we, are, uh, we don't have a lot of time, I would ask Mila and Boena if it's possible to check the chat and maybe in your response later on, you can include some of the questions. So Natasha, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. Um, they're so rich. Uh, there's just so much to talk about and I see that they've already engendered uh, lively discussion in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quick anecdote. Um, I recently came across the diary of Alexandra Flaker, a Yugoslav scholar of Russian avant-garde literature. Uh, titled Beslinia, the diary includes the previously unpublished notes he took in 1950 and 1951 while he represented Yugoslavia among US and European students uh, on, an, on exchange programs in Europe and North America, respectively. As they travel from the Netherlands to Canada on a ship, the students take turns giving lectures and showing documentaries from their countries so as to represent them in the best possible light. What is fascinating about this is not only that Yugoslavia is already very concerned with its international image and clearly invested in promoting it only five years after the war, but also that Flacker develops a sharp leftist political analysis. Um, he notes his alienation from both American and European students and his immediate affinity with Indonesian students living in the Netherlands who alone understand our Yugoslav situation. He is thrilled when they question an apologist for Dutch colonialism during a lecture. 
So in a prophetic mode, Flakir says, we should bring more Indonesian students to Yugoslavia. Uh, so I start with this anecdote because the memoir uh, or the, the diary is a cultural and historical testament to these kind of uh, proto-NAM anti-colonial affinities before NAM, which is kind of the history that Baina seeks to reconstruct. But it is also an interesting example of Yugoslavia's use of film to promote a positive image of the country on the international stage, an example of cultural diplomacy that Mill's presentation focuses on. These presentations are both concerned with the role of visual arts and media and cultural diplomacy, but also the ways in which new aesthetic and narrative paradigms in art make possible new political imaginaries. So as I was uh, listening to both presentations and having read other work by Boyan and Mila, um, I was struck by the number of roles these uh, visual um, uh, arts and films were playing in the context of war, especially. So agitprop engaged art uh, as a mode of historical documentation archive, um, they also staged the imagined community of the nation, both locally and on the global stage. Uh, also, they were acting as witness uh, and sometimes even as a survivor. Um, as a scholar of cultural narratives, uh, especially literature and film, I'm interested in how narrative operates in the film that Mila discusses. Uh, the visual artists and workers, uh, both you and uh, Boyana write about, are intimately involved in battle. So either literally, literally fighting as partisans or as in the case of Labudovic, a former partisan wearing the ALN uniform while wielding uh, the camera as his weapon. I'm interested in this interplay between the artist and the resistance fighter and how they affect each other, especially as the artist might depict, for, in, for instance, the very battle in which they participate, but nonetheless does so retrospectively, choosing how to depict it, what to foreground and what to omit, who to feature as a protagonist, et cetera. So in terms of the Yugoslav representations of the Algerian War of Independence, the embedded writer slash fighter figure also comes up in a number of travelogues. For instance, uh, Zdravko Petra's Algir and Georgia Milenkovic's uh, Sa Algirskim Ustanicim, or with uh, Algerian rebels. Former partisans who went to Algeria as embedded reporters with ALN, Petra and Milenkovic wore the uniform and obtained exclusive access to battles in which they participated ideologically. So the travelogues they wrote, however, contain many familiar narrative tropes from the Yugoslav partisan literature and films. Hero heroic battles, military discipline, strong leaders, people suffering, hope and victory despite the odds. So this is especially interesting as Petr um, is the one who instructs Labudovic on what to include and foreground as he films in Algeria. But of course, as we learned in the presentation, there, uh, he, he films the footage, but then there's so many other people involved in actually creating the narrative and providing the voiceover. So my question for Mila is, what are some narrative or aesthetic tropes that you see in the Yugoslav films made about the Algerian war uh, or perhaps other wars of liberation that they filmed um, about, do they draw on Yugoslav partisan iconography? Um, does it make sense to even place them in conversation? Uh, for Boyana, um, the uh, non post-war connections and cross-pollinations are clearer, but when you talk about Yugoslav pre-war artists who had a lot in common with the artists from uh, what would become future non nations, uh, I was wondering what specifically accounts for this similarity and affinity. So for instance, you say the Yugoslav artists like South American African artists all respond to Western hegemony and seek alternative decolonized artistic expressions and themes, but the connections seem too uh, broad right now. So for example, in, your, in the broader version of this, in the essay that I read uh, for the collection, at one point you place Yugoslav art in conversation with uh, Mexican revolutionary art, Nigerian anti-colonial art, as well as negritude, but beyond anti-colonialism anti as a common denominator, um, these arise from very different contexts and include a variety of aesthetic expressions. For instance, negritude alone is a complex tradition with conflicting ideas about aesthetics and politics and also um, questions of ontology, especially uh, related also to uh, questions of race. Um, so if this is a project perhaps that you will continue refining, I think it would be um, important to tease out more specific overlaps beyond a general kind of anti-colonial stance. So whether conceptual, aesthetic, them thematic, political, um, and so on. And so my other comment refers to the ways in which Western modernist and avant-garde art all seems to be represented as uh, dominantly apolitical and aloof. Um, and so while, uh, of course, there is agreement, right, that most Western artists were not, uh, were apolitical um, and, and were not living through war or anti-colonial revolution, we can also think of engaged 
leftist modernist writers, uh, for instance, who may not have fought for their lives, but were nonetheless living in situations of internal colonialism or discrimination. So we can trace this leftist line in Western modernism also through figures like African-American authors, um, Ralph Ellison or James Baldwin or Jewish American poets, Muriel Rukeyser or Louis Zukofsky or German author, Alfred Doblin or even uh, Walter Benjamin. So, um, so this is another comment on just kind of the larger uh, project that you're working on. But uh, just going back to my first question, I was wondering if you can maybe flesh out these global connections more between Yugoslav pre-war art and art in the global South that might go beyond kind of a shared opposition to Western hegemonic models and this kind of common like anti-colonial attitude, like other like thematic or like particular like formal or aesthetic um, similarities that you see that they're um, uh, all addressing at the same time. So um, I think I'm out of time. So I'm gonna stop here and just kind of um, allow for uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much, Natasha. We have, let's say 10 more minutes to discuss. Uh, and then I would immediately give a uh, word to Mila and Boena. Mila can start to respond to Natasha's question and maybe uh, to some questions from chat if you read them yeah, yourself. Okay, so Mila, five minutes, and then I, I would say Boena for five minutes, and then we will take a short break. Oh, um, let me see if I can keep the answers brief then, because I, I want to try and answer several things. So yes, Natasha, concerning this question of can we place, you know, Yugoslav partisan cinema in conversation with the work that the cameramen were doing for other liberation movements? Absolutely. Uh, already from a very practical perspective, which is that the cinematic exchange, if you like, began by the gifting of films about the Yugoslav liberation struggle to these liberation movements as a way to study the tactics as well. So when in, in this meeting of, in 1959, when the Algerian delegation came to Belgrade, they actually asked for films and they were gifted a projector and films in order to be able to study um, the tactics of the of the of, of the partisan movement, but it's not. It obviously goes beyond that. So talking about the tropes, two that I found really striking um, are um, the assistance of the support of the general population of the liberation movement. So a lot of what Labudovic was doing was not just filming with uh, the fighters in the combat units. He was also filming in the refugee camps and really trying to capture scenes of how they draw their force and their support from, from the local populations, which is something that I think you can consider a trope of Yugoslav partisan cinema as well. And then um, an, another one has to do with this idea of the application of principles of justice and fairness within the hierarchy of the movement itself. So how they treat the French prisoners, there's all this, there's this idea that within the movement, you know, the political principles of the future society are already being implemented. And that as well is something that I, I you know, I think you consider a trope of, of um, Yugoslav partisan cinema. There was a question about the colonial dynamic between the Yugoslav filmmakers and the local populations. I mean, it's a complicated question to answer because, well, first of all, if you consider the colonial dynamic of filmmaking, you know, in French colonies, the Laval decree forbade, forbade local filmmakers to make films. The, the 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 local population was actually forbidden from making cinema. So you know, I, I think we're not talking in the same kind of register of relationships. But the Yugoslavs did have this idea of training local cameramen, um, and this was a very complex thing as well. So oftentimes the cameramen would then be sent on scholarships to Yugoslavia to learn and then come back to film. Didn't always work out, um, and. What I could say is that they were trying to be, I think, very inclusive in the authorship process of the making, particularly of the newsreels in Mali and Tanzania. So they would hire Malian or Tanzanian students who were on scholarships in Belgrade to come to the editing offices of Filmskin Novosti and help them in choosing the music, uh, help them in translating the, the voiceovers. So in that sense, I think we can, you know, we can explore a dynamic that was complex, but I, I really don't think it ascribes itself into this idea of a you know, colonial relationship between um, the Yugoslav filmmakers and, and, and the, the populations that they were filming. Um, and then there was another comment that had to do with political imaginaries on a general sense, you know, whether this analysis of cinema as a space of political imaginaries is, is purely an intellectual exercise or not. And I actually really would disagree with the notion that because political imaginaries are not tangible, they're, they're, you know, they're kind of a fatuous thing to explore because 
at the origin of every political project is the necessity to project that vision and the projecting of a political dream and a projecting political vision is something that cinema has proven to, to lend itself really richly to. So for me, this idea of exploring then the complexity of these images that are, you know, a promise of a future that never came, that are kind of this perfect version of a project that was never implemented as purely as the image. Um, these are things that I think are really rewarding to examine. I don't actually think that they in any way negate the tangible gains of the movement, but they leave us with a conundrum of what to do with these images today. So how to activate them and use them today, I think in an emancipatory way for today's projections of a future, of a future world. I don't know if that helps to answer any of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Buena. Okay, yeah, there's a lot there, uh, Natasha. Thank you. This is these are exactly the questions that I'm thinking about, and this is a this is a, a longer project. It's not just one paper, uh, which was, by the way, a draft as well. So uh, and also, um, so let me just try to answer the first question, which is the connections. There are absolutely formal affinities that come actually from the training and art education as it was organized both in Yugoslavia and in other countries. So in fact, um, one of the major influences in how modernism was understood was through art education. So when uh, Okeke writes about, you know, writes his synthesis, he's also thinking about art schools that were organized in Nigeria through the British. And in fact, he rebels against those art schools. Um, similarly, you know, Krleža writes about that and it's not for nothing that, you know, uh, Hege Dusic wants to engage worker artists who were not trained in the academy. So that in itself is a very important mix as was, for example, in uh, Mexican muralism. And after the revolution in Cuba, naive art or art for uh, uneducated, uh, not uneducated, non-academically trained artists becomes one of the most important political uh, artistic projects. So art institutions, how art is educated, uh, how art institutions were built like museums and galleries was extremely important to uh, understanding how these artists rebelled against or wanted to reject uh, that. So um, I see the links between not just, you know, uh, the material conditions of being, you know, uh, sub, uh, sub subjugated, right, that Krleža talks about and, you know, uh, Indian artists are talking about the 30s, but also uh, the, 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 the life of the art, right, and institutions of the art. Um, uh, representation of women, my last slide actually had women who I want to highlight who were participating as curators in particular and art managers. So unfortunately, I couldn't show my slide there, but women were extremely important. And that's something I've been looking at very recently and have been basically uncovering all of the curators, arts managers, writers, art historians who have been you know, involved with this uh, exchange. Um, also, one thing that I want to say about political in this art is that, and this is something that perhaps um, makes Yugoslav artists different than um, other Western artists, is that, is that yes, they've been politically engaged in the form of making art, but Yugoslav artists, like some of the um, uh, post-colonial artists, were actually participating in structure and structuring of the state, so that they were actually building and were were part of the state, of the state institutions. Um, I was mentioning Kocha Popovic yesterday, who was a surrealist poet, and then became a general, and then became part of the state, and part of the non-aligned. Um, Marko Ristic is another example, who, like him, uh, became one of the heads of cultural exchange, international cultural exchange, um, and was a um, uh, politically engaged artist. So, unlike with some of the Western artists, what these artists are, are doing are actually building the, the, the social estate as well. Um, someone in the, in the, po uh, in the um, um, chat was asking, what about the abstract art and the turn towards abstract art? Absolutely. One of the things that I talked about is this very, um, uh, very uh, idiosyncratic hybrid form of realism um, that was, or art, not just realism, but art in general in Yugoslavia that opens up in the 1950s that becomes inclusive 
of both sort of uh, very hard realist forms and abstract forms. So yes, someone like uh, Lubarda or others can actually equally contribute to the uh, representation of the, um, um, to the um, um, NAM. Um, someone was asking me, how do I corre correlate visual production of Zemna to number of art groups in Central East Europe? Um, I haven't looked at that because my goal was uh, to see how this relates to the non-aligned. Uh, but absolutely, I mean, I, I, I can only do so much in one uh, research project, but I haven't looked at that uh, in particular as yet, but I'm sure I will come to this uh, in my, in developing of this project. So I think I've answered most of the questions, if not. Uh, thank you, Buena. I think it's impossible to, ask, to answer to all the questions in such short time that we have. I'm sorry that we cannot uh, have a longer discussion. This is how it is, how is how it, uh, we planned. But the good thing is that uh, we will save the chat and uh, we will find a way how to distribute this for everyone. But uh, I can also say, um, uh, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. On the 1st of March, uh, there is going to be some kind of uh, taverna zoom for all interested participants to continue uh, with the discussions that emerged here during these four days. Yes, absolutely, Ksenia. And I, I apologize because my camera is not working. I think on the first day I announced it as Tuesday and found I had a double date. Um, so we're moving it to Monday, the 1st of March at uh, four o'clock. Um, and I will post in the chat the, the Zoom link or you can send me an email. Okay, so thank you, Boyan, Amila, Natasha. Thank you all. I would say that we meet again at five, uh, five, five. So we have, we can have like 20 minutes break. Okay, uh, so welcome back. Uh, we are starting with the second part of today's session. And we will continue with uh, Liljana Kolesnik uh, from Institute of Art History from Zagreb, Boana Piškur, Museum of Modern Art Ljubljana, and Aida Hodžić, the University of Florida. Uh, the first one, uh, we'll... I'm, I'm resuming now, though. Not... Oh, sorry. Okay, we have to... Okay, I, I can mute Peter. <laughs> Zoom is amazing. Okay, uh, Liliana is a senior researcher fellow at the Institute of Art History in Zagreb. In her work, she focuses on post-war modern art and the cultural policies of socialist Yugoslavia, and in recent years on the methodology of digital art history. Liliana, the floor is yours. If you want to add something about yourself also, please do. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, I can do that for you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you uh, to Paul for organizing this really, really important event, uh, which is even more important in my opinion, because this this year is uh, um, the 50th of uh, uh, the six years after the first conference in, in, in Belgrade. And I'm not sure whether it will be much talk about non-aligned movement in the countries of former Yugoslavia concerning the date. So I think this conference is very, very important. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm the title of my presentation, which I will start sharing with you now. Do you see it on your screens? Yes, yes. Okay. Is the center circulation? She was a non aligned cultural policy. And uh, <clears throat> it's focusing on 
the practices of Yugoslav cultural exchange with non-aligned uh, member countries in the 1960s and 70s, up to the moment in which the last administrative body of federal government delegated with such task Federal Council for International Technical, Cultural and Educational Exchange was dissolved in 1978. Um, I will also explain uh, or more precisely describe the institutional structure and organizational model supporting the important uh, uh, implementation of the non-aligned cultural policies in that period and try to point out some of these shortcomings, which I found both interesting and deported, important for understanding Yugoslav relation and self-positioning within the space-time of non-aligned cultures. Um, the Federal Commission for, for, uh, for Foreign Cultural Relations was established in uh, already at the beginning of the 1950s, but, uh, and it was, uh, it, it was uh, very important both for uh, crafting the self, uh, the, the, the propositions or the conditions for Yugoslav self-presentation at the international art scene, as all, but also uh, affecting in a number of uh, um, indirect ways the situation at the Yugoslav art scene at the time. Uh, my view of the Yugoslav art, post-war artists um, uh, and, and in, the, in, the, in the relation to non-aligned movement also is quite different from Boyanas, but perhaps I will come to that at some, time, at some point during my presentation. Uh, Federal Commission for Foreign Cultural Relations was, uh, the, uh, 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 at times it was a part of of Ministry of, 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 of Government, at, at, at some point it was independent, uh, but in the 1960s, it was actually the most important institution for crafting, uh, of transferring the, the, the conceptual, the, the, the uh, non-aligned cultural policies from its conceptual level to the organizational and performative level, that is to organize the entire packages of, of cultural exchange. And at this presentation, I will focus only on visual arts, which I think is a very, very interesting segment of that cultural exchange. <clears throat> uh, also trying to uh, stating that uh, if you compare the context, uh, the content, uh, content and the structure of Yugoslav cultural exchange with foreign countries, uh, uh, even after the, the NAM came into the picture, it was quite conventional and uh, much alike to the to, to the pack, uh, cultural exchange packages that you could find in the practices of so number of West European and East European uh, countries, and of course strongly framed by the cultural politics of the Cold War. And uh, in this structure presented here, I would like to point. Uh, regarding the, the, the term decentered circulation see in, in the title of this presentation, uh, this element, I don't know if you see my, my arrow. There was a Federal Commission for Foreign Cultural Relations Analysts and Researchers. <clears throat> People that were, uh, sometime, that, that were working for the commission, but also some of them were working for Yugoslav embassies all over the world and providing the commission with the, with the information uh, quite often on technical, uh, on technical uh, context in which a certain cultural package would, would come or would sit in, in the country to which it was dedicated. But um, um, in, um, so Federal Commission was through the, its councils, numerous one visual uh, council was just one of them, uh, was also uh, um, forming a network of museums and galleries that were uh, that were actually taking the, the burden of, of representing uh, the, the art of other uh, countries in Yugoslavia and preparing the, 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 the traveling exhibitions that were sent to sent abroad. And in the period of the 60s, there was the quite a few, there was a, a really a huge number of such exhibitions, a number of which uh, will, was almost exponentially rising in the 70s. 
And I will also point here to art colonies that were partially under the um, um, kind of administration of federal commission, but actually were run by uh, a national and federal association of visual artists, because it is also important for that term decentralized circulations. Um, in uh, a, certain, a certain shift in this rather conventional, and I would say a routine type of, of cultural exchange uh, happened at, in relation to the non-aligned countries. Uh, I could, uh, I, I spotted at, at the end of the, of the, of the, of the commission's uh, working cycle. It was abandoned in 1967 but was continued with the work uh, related to, uh, as, as a part of Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 70s, because there was some administrational reconstruction uh, going on. And uh, it was succeeded in the 72 with the entire different body that I will also present in my next slide. So on, in, in the 1967 and 1966 and 1967, there was, um, I found uh, three uh, very interesting and, and ample reports uh, given by the people that were not, uh, there are, there is, there are no, uh, they're not signed with the names, but with the number, I believe it's some kind of code number that's connected to, to the way the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs operated at that time giving a very interesting insight into the cultures and into the status of, of visual arts and other, and, and actually the entire art production of the countries, West Africa countries. Um, apart, uh, the, the, the thing which seems to me a kind of, which, on which I based my, my notion of shift is that uh, the conclusion drawn from, from, from uh, that research uh, were based on the conversation that the people who prepared those reports led with the people from the government of the countries they have visited, um, uh, cultural actors, uh, leaders of the uh, cultural institutions, people from the universities, students, uh, but also a common people, asking the question how much they know about Yugoslavia and uh, whether and what they would like to know. And also a very important question, what they think would be the most um, proper form uh, they would like to, uh, that would be perhaps most effective in, in uh, providing such information. Um, it's very important that film is at the top of the list. And uh, um, also there are, there are mention of the exhibitions. And uh, so the, the, the recommendation at the end of, this, uh, of those uh, reports, they, they differ um, according to the level of education and communication possibilities of each reporter, uh, in a sense that uh, out of those three, three people, two are, uh, absolutely uh, speaking, uh, speaking uh, languages of the communities they have visited, and uh, they have a, a very wide humanistic education and also very sharp eyes, eye for 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 uh, for the situ for for um, explain for detecting the most interesting elements in or most important elements uh, in the at the cultural scenes of the countries they have visited. And uh, there, is a, there is a recommendation to, when, when, when thinking about the cultural exchange and the content of the cult cultural packages, perhaps it would be uh, wise to sit down with the people from different social groups and representative of different arts and different types of cultural production in those countries and to see actually to, to establish a kind of, of e dialogue, dialogue of equals and try to craft the program of cultural exchange that would really bring two cultures, Yugoslav culture and the culture of the, of the country to, to which uh, the cultural package is intended to closer and the closer to the, to the receptive possibilities of those communities. 
<clears throat> it is. Uh, um, I was dealing. I, I was researching the activities of community of, of uh, Commission for Cultural uh, um, Foreign Cultural Relations for uh, for quite a long time, and this is the only the only type of 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 of, um, of report or suggestion or idea how to reconstruct the, the 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 type of cultural exchange that was already there <clears throat> i must admit that i i didn't see in in, in, the, in the following years i don't see any uh, substantial change in 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 the practices developed those routine practices developed by the commission but the thing which is also interesting is that those reports mentioned and then you will find also in the reports of our experts, Yugoslav experts involved with the African countries uh, through the UN, UNESCO, and other international organizations, of the people who uh, establish their personal connections with the with the with the with the African cultures and who are active there. They some of them were involved in certain projects, but remained in in the countries to which they came, and were uh, developing the personal networks that are quite interesting, but remain completely outside of this official type of cultural exchange. <clears throat> One thing which is um, also important uh, to say that at this period, those cultural packages that are exchanged with non countries um, in, in, in the field of visual arts uh, are completely in tune with the dominant hege hegemonic idea of modernism that is, is in, in, in foundation of Yugoslav self-representation at the international arts scene. And I don't see any concessions, concessions there. there. Uh, um, I'm very sorry that we still didn't finish. I, I couldn't present it now, but we are now trying to, <clears throat> to, to make a kind of, a, or, or to reconstruct the network of all the artists that were involved in this cultural, uh, in, in, in the uh, activities of cultural ex uh, exchange in the field of visual arts, but also their artworks uh, and, and trying to categorize them to, uh, in, in relation to, to their stylistic specifications. And um, I think that uh, our initial thesis that Yugoslavia didn't make concessions or trying to, to adopt uh, its, its self-representation in non countries to some idea of, 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 uh, of a perhaps lower degree of, of, of reception possibilities or in, to tune it to some idea of, of realism and more acceptable way of representation. I, I don't find such, at this point, I don't find any proof of such uh, claim. Uh, one thing which is also important to, to say uh, uh, related, directly related to the, to the, to the stylistic uh, content of the uh, exchange packages is that at this point in 1960s and um, until the beginning of the 1970s and uh, uh, establishment of the new structure uh, that was um, dedicated to, to a cultural exchange, uh, 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 the uh, uh, republics like Macedonia, Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro were highly underrepresented. And uh, it, in, in my opinion, it was a serious problem that was corrected uh, by the establishment of this new body, Federal Council for Technical, Cultural and Educational Exchange. And the structure of the, this entire structure is also reflected the changes which happened in the structure of uh, uh, federal administration, uh, reflecting the process of decentralization where you actually, actually have the republics and provinces as, uh, as an actors, important actors in the cultural exchange, approving or suggesting certain programs and exhibitions that are then discussed at the meetings of uh, a coordination, a commission for the coordination between republics and provinces, which is under the auspices of federal council. But uh, whatever they decide is actually a, a decision that the council approves. Uh, federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs is still uh, quite involved. Uh, all the actors from the previous previous structure are also here, but there is uh, in this at that performative level there is a new institution or, or a new group of institution, 
youth, uh, youth cultural institutions uh, who are entering this, 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 this uh, um, arena of cultural exchange on their own terms. But uh, that which I have to admit, uh, they are mostly oriented towards the exchange with the West Europe. Um, one thing which is important here is that uh, uh, the Commission is operating, I think, I don't know if I already said it, according to the Republic key, which means that the uh, uh, obligations among, uh, between republics and provinces are uh, equally delegated. And each Republican province has a task to organize certain type of certain number of the exhibition and is responsible for their content. And I think that uh, from this moment on is the uh, real uh, uh, state of art of the Yugoslav scene much more, uh, much closer to, to its, its, uh, its real writings and structure than it was in this previous period. But concerning the, the, the uh, introduction of the new forms of communication concerning the, the um, some alternative alternative types of, of exchange, you cannot find it here uh, under the auspices of this, this uh, federal body. Um, one thing which is also very important for, for, uh, for Yugoslav uh, exchange with non-aligned countries uh, is also something which, uh, or, or, which is the element of the cultural, of, of this uh, uh, policies of cultural exchange and um, which I have already mentioned uh, to function pretty routinely until that episode at the end of the 60s, is that um, there was some, uh, I, would, I, would, I, I don't know if you could call, call the mistake, but there was some misunderstandings that could be uh, possible to spot at the very beginning of this more intense exchange with non-aligned countries. And those uh, mistakes that you could, or, or omissions that you could ascribe to some initial uh, problems with, with, with finding the, the proper way of communication with, with, uh, with uh, African, Asian, and, and, and Latin American culture. But Latin America is a completely different problem. Um, is, uh, in, in, in my opinion, pointing to two. Uh, very important problems which uh, affected public reception of African Asian uh, uh, and Asian post-war art in Yugoslavia. I'm deliberately not using the term post-colonial or decolonial modernisms when talking about that art um, as their common signifier, but I'm opting for the term counter-modernism. Um, understood as the relation of the local modernisms to their hegemonic counterpart, imbued by both the freedom of appropriation and rejection and uh, engagement and indifference, and framed by the simultaneous development of their own situated vocabularies and meanings. Uh, thus understood, the notion of counter-modernism does not exclude, of course, does not exclude the essential experience of post-colonial struggle, but reinforces the alternative genealogies of the post-war art that are more open, in my opinion, to the concept of intersectionality in number of different ways. Uh, however, I'm not... Sorry, I'm, interrupting. Uh, the time is up, so if you can I'm wrap sorry. it up, please. Sorry. Uh, I, I just wanted to illustrate that my, that uh, in, that that uh, initial that uh, misunderstanding by the example of two exhibitions. One is the ex exhibition of Algerian art. Uh, that, that was Algerian popular art, miniature air contem contemporary art that was exhibited in ethnographic museum. Uh, um, and it is, it is it, 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 in my opinion, it points to a, a complete misunderstanding of the very concept of national culture and its uh, 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 integrational uh, idea of, of, of integration of, of different layers and different types of expression, which is in a way even resembling the idea of synthesis, but in completely different terms, which occurred in Yugoslav art at the very beginning of the 50s 
in, in, in its uh, first and unsuccessful attempt to, to establish itself as also a, a type of counter modernism, which Anna Offak uh, uh, so, so interestingly point, uh, pointed out. And the exhibition of the Senegalese art today that was presented uh, in, in Belgrade in 1975, it was just trans uh, uh, it was uh, uh, transferred from Rome to Belgrade uh, uh, without uh, any uh, any uh, effort to explain that art and to to understand its its relation to 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 high modernism with uh, with uh, bringing the text of Italian uh, uh, translation of the Italian introduction that was written by the uh, 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 the film director working a long for a long time in in Africa and knowing quite quite well the African art scene neither uh, trying to explain the, the, the notion of negativity that was very important for understanding West African art scene so that uh, both exhibitions had quite a, few, uh, a, 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 a reception that I think was far beyond their importance for understanding visual cultures of non-alignment. And um, uh, in relation to, to different or an overlapping temporalities and, 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 and spatial, spatial extensions of, 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 uh, of non-alignment, and in relation to a very particular type of vis visual discourse produced in, in Cuba, uh, that is uh, connected to the idea of revolution and resistance, uh, I would suggest that uh, you was that another perhaps type of the central uh, uh, approach to 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 the non visual non uh, 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 visual cultures was the Yugoslav, the, 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 the a kind of change of policy in representing non-Yugoslav uh, uh, liberation, uh, national liber liberation struggle by using uh, uh, modern art, by using abstraction, uh, semi-abstraction and trying in a way to bring it closer to the public of the, this discourse produced in, in Cuba. And still another, just, just a short point, uh, but I think it's very important. It's um, um, uh, at the end of the uh, 80s, the, of the 70s, there was a number of the round table discussions concerning the position of culture in the development, um, economic development of Africa that were held in Belgrade. And um, um, there was a very important, uh, in, in my opinion, very important statement by by the president of, uh, the, of the Institute for uh, Cultural Exchange at that point, um, who by explaining Yugoslav relation to, to African culture, because most of the participants were from, from African countries, said that uh, he hopes that he will not be wrong, claiming that uh, in uh, the last 15 years, that is in the 60s and the 70s, uh, Yugoslavia served as a kind of the bridge which allowed a number of African countries to first enter into the cultural space of the world. That was precise in, 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 the, in the next sentence as a West Europe. So I think that there, there is a, a kind of a, 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 a hegemonic self-perception on, on behalf of Yugoslavia at least in, in the field of, 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 of visual arts and, 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 and perhaps uh, some other types of production, which uh, could be further examined, but also not understood as an exception, because I think that such hegemonic positions, which are shifting through the time and space of, of non-alignment, could be also ascribed to India, to Colombia, to Algeria on different, in, in, in different uh, uh, points in time. And, uh, I will not, I, I have still one little uh, um, reference to, to, um, to uh, African cultures, but I think this, this will be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will continue then immediately with the presentation of Boana. Uh, actually presentation prepared as I understood uh, by Boana Pishkur and Georgi Balzamovic. 
Bojana Piškor works as a curator in the modern Galleria in Ljubljana. Her focus of professional interest is on political issues as they relate to or are manifested in the field of art with special emphasis on the region of former Yugoslavia. Bojana, the floor is yours. If you want to, of course, as others add something about yourself, please. No, no, thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you for the invitation to this conference that I think is very important. Uh, I would also like to say hello and wave to all my dear friends that I haven't seen in a long time and I see they're present uh, now here. And I would also like to point to my uh, background in the office that is uh, very much in line with today's topic. Now, uh, let me share the screen. It might take a little bit before I find it. It's okay, right? You can see it. Yes. Okay, yes. So, okay great. Um, I will talk briefly about my research on the non-aligned cultural politics. Uh, this research has started uh, already a while ago and research, uh, resulted in some exhibitions, talks, texts, and many new transnational networks. But when Paul proposed uh, a text for the book on the NAM that he's uh, working on, I, I thought that perhaps we could experiment with a different format, not just a text. So I asked George Balmazovic from the Shkart group, um, who is also the author of all the images that you will see, uh, to collaborate with me on this project. And the outcome is a short graphic novel. So let's begin with arts and culture that were accorded particular importance in the non-aligned movement, even though this might not be as obvious as they never took center stage at summits um, and conferences. However, when the delegates did discuss culture, the emphasis was placed on more general issues such as cultural equality, rehabilitation of suppressed cultures, uh, restitution of works of art, which as you know, is still a burning issue today, struggle for decolonization in the field of culture, cultural heritage and its preservation, cooperation in arts and culture between NAM members and similar. All these issues are of course very important, but the question for us, the researchers, the curators, the artists were, what did during the 60 years of its existence, the non-aligned transnational network actually produce? Was there a common fabric that created a new international narrative in art? The answer is that there obviously existed heterogeneous artistic production, a variety of cultural politics, an extensive cultural network, and many forms of hybrid artistic and cultural production. But there was no non-aligned modernism, no common artistic style or genre. Let me explain. Um, after the Second World War, the main orientation in arts and culture in many non-aligned, decolonized, newly independent countries, as well as in Yugoslavia, was primarily the one following the Western epistemic canon. And this is something that already Liliana touched upon. The other non-Western story that comprised of various, let's say, provincialized modernisms, propagated ideas that were often in line with political issues that uh, non-aligned addressed. It can even be said that these modernisms were actually promulgated without a deeper understanding of other cultures. They were usually interpreted in the frame of ethnology or traditional arts and crafts, as it's clear from reports, texts, and specific cases, such as exhibitions and museums from the era and that what you can see is uh, some information of exhibition from the NAM countries in Moderna Galleria and in the Slovene Ethnographic Museum. And as you can see in Moderna Galleria since 1948 until 1991, we actually had only three such exhibitions. If I'm not counting the graphic biennials, of course. But what did occur within the NAM landscape, however, was a potential to 
think with the difference. And this difference would pluralize the experience of modernity and create different parallel histories and local narratives. And at the same time, enable the discussion about the meaning of art outside the Western canon. So I use this um, uh, syntagm cross-cultural pollination, which is um, actually similar as cross-fertilization, but this is Leopold Senghor's term, and it's uh, quite uh, defined already related to negritude and pan-Africanisms. So uh, pollination in the way I use it, it means uh, local to local approach, uh, cultures influencing one another or juxtaposition could also be the word. So the research cases, I will talk about these cases now. Um, these cases were basically all part of the exhibition Southern Constellation that we organized in Moderna Galleria a few years ago. Um, and observed from the perspective of pollination, uh, we can say that some of these cases uh, have been more successful, some were more influential than others, and some were radically different. So the story of cross-cultural pollination is still far from being concluded. The task is not only to study historical cases, but also to discern what were the actual consequences of those progressive, even emancipatory cultural politics on art and heritage and how they affected the culture in them, development of new kinds of art institutions, networks, and epistemologies of uh, knowledge. So I will have to be very brief and just say a few words about each case. And I go to the first one, which is uh, Ljubljana Biennial of Graphic Arts, which is also one of the oldest. Um, it was founded in 55 in uh, my place, that is Moderna Galleria. And it was to be a practical example of Yugoslavia's cultural diplomacy, especially after the first NAM conference in 61. However, uh, the Biennial's orientation was primarily toward the West with the Western art styles, such as abstract expressionism, op, pop art, new abstraction, minimalism, and so on, predominating in all of the exhibition. And this is very clear from the way the biennials were organized, what kind of works were included and how were they were shown. Prints from the non-aligned countries were usually shown in the basement spaces uh, and were often regarded as ethnographic, pre-modern or, or traditional. Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende in Santiago de Chile um, is another very specific case. An appeal was sent to the artists of the world in 1971 to support the new socialist path Chile was taking by donating works of art for the new museum. So in the committee for this museum were Salvador Allende, the president, and Mario Pedrosa, who was an art critic exiled from Brazil, and Mario Pedrosa is here on the drawing, um, exiled from Brazil to Chile, and then after 73, exiled to Mexico, and from Mexico, exiled to France, where he died. So um, they asked for the donation, but this act of donation was more than a donation. It was an act of political and artistic solidarity with the Chilean project based on internationalist, socialist, non-aligned political ideas. And there is a um, representative uh, donation from Yugoslavia, even though this donation uh, went via Paris, via Chilean embassy there, where interestingly, Pablo Neruda was an ambassador. And this is the work by Vladimir Velichkovich, a uh, painting from 1972. The museum experiment ended abruptly in 1973 with the Pinochet coup d'etat and was reactivated only in 1991 as an institution tackling not merely its rich collections and archives, but also approaching difficult political issues of Chilean and Latin American history. You are most probably familiar with this museum, Museum of African Art. Uh, and you see here on the image, Zerao uh, Kondeda Pechar, um, which donated uh, basically all their uh, works from Africa to this museum. Museum opened in Belgrade in 77 and was at that time promoted as the only anti-colonial museum in Europe. 
The original permanent exhibition design still exists today as a reminder of a time when grand ideas of anti-colonialism, equality, solidarity, and humanist ideals permitted cultural politics in the non countries. But on the other hand, the taxonomies and other methodologies regarding the museum's collection were almost completely based on Western models. So the curators, uh, these are my dear, dear colleagues, uh, Emilia Epstein from the museum and Anna Sladojevic, who's not working in the museum any longer. They're, they are, they have been, and they're still well aware of this paradigm and lately museums non-aligned legacy and its collections have been reconceptualized in the light of new epistemologies of knowledge and alternative cultural networks. Um, also interesting are cases of non-cultural politics that were written in the 1970s under UNESCO. And the one, the one from Zaire during the time of uh, Mobutu Sese Seku was probably one of the most radical ones. And it's uh, still an excellent case study of such cu cultural paradigms even today. So a do doctrine called La Authenticité aimed to erase all traces of Belgian colonialism in art and culture in Zaire. Instead of Western influences, the Zaireans searched for sources in their ancestral or traditional heritage. And then there was a news agency pool that was already mentioned today, established in 1975 on the initiative of Yugoslav press agency Tanyuk. Within a year, uh, 25 members joined the pool, among them APS Algeria, Telam Argentina, ADP Chat, and many others. Um, the main objectives were to improve and exchange of information between its members, to free themselves from their dependence on major international press agency, and to disseminate correct and factual information about the non-aligned countries. Even though the pool ceased to exist in the mid-90s, it is a reminder that the potential for a more equal and balanced information and cultural flows strategies already existed not so long ago. The only art institution that was established directly under the patronage of NAM was inaugurated in Titograd in 1984. But at the time uh, when it was established, the collection was criticized by some prominent Yugoslav art historians as comprised of works from faraway exotic places, from auto authoritarian states that support official arts and so on. It's true that the gallery was a political project from uh, the very beginning, but on the other hand, the collection's potential to challenge the way the Western art operates and produces hegemonic narratives and canons was not particularly well understood either. And unlike Western colonial museums of the past, the, the gallery in Titograd acquired this art of the world solely in the form of gifts and donation. And today this is more than 1000 works while attempting to develop its own cultural networks and to combine this with experiences from other parts of the non-aligned world. Uh, this case was already mentioned today, I'll just skip it. So the architecture of Van Molivan. Uh, Van Molivan was an architect from Cambodia who in the years after the independence and before the Khmer Rouge constructed almost 100 projects in the country. The most famous being the National Sports Complex built in the capital of Phnom Penh in 1962. And you can see here uh, in the drawing. Van Molivan studied architecture in Paris and upon his return to Cambodia combined this knowledge with traditional Khmer architecture. He successfully articulated the idea and showed the world how it was possible to direct one's own modernization process in a post-colonial developing non-aligned country such as Cambodia. After the independence of Bangladesh in 71, the Shilpakala Academy was established and under its auspices, the first Asian Art Biennial was held in Dhaka in 1981. The initiative came from Sia Jahangir, who was painter and also organizer of art events. Even though the first edition focused on Asia, the biennial has since grown to include artists from other parts of the world. So the biennial can be observed in the frame of alternative routes of cultural exchange, for example, various biennials in New Delhi, Baghdad, Havana, to name a few, that emerged in the countries of the non-aligned movement after 61. 
Alternative networks existed not only in arts and culture, but also in sports. So the Ganefo Games, sometimes even called the Counter Olympics, were organized in line with the prevailing uh, ideas of NAM, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, as well as solidarity and cooperation between the emerging third world nations. Um, and then there was the last grant exhibition under NAM auspices that happened in 95 in Jakarta with almost 300 works by artists from 42 NAM countries, including Croatia with Nada Berosh as curator and Gorgona group as participants. There, were a lot of, there was a lot of criticism of the exhibition at the time, mainly because it was supported by the Indonesian states and Suharto's government's attitude to freedom of expression was at that time problematic, extremely problematic. A seminar was also organized in the frame of the exhibition discussing concepts such as Southern perspective in art and South as a place of change and solidarity. And uh, last but not least, the exhibition that I mentioned at the beginning, Southern Constellation, which is the outcome of research on the role of art and culture within the non-aligned movement. Um, so there were uh, now already a couple of exhibition made, a couple more will be uh, organized in the future. And all these uh, exhibitions are stations that are conceptualized in a slightly different way, according to the particular context and local specificities with the aim of creating a larger transnational networks. And to conclude, uh, maybe even more important than a uh, historical perspective is a contemporary one, which opens the question of the use or relevance of NAM's ideas for today. In which context can we rethink the NAM? How to use these um, ideas in a practical, political sense? And what to do with NAM's cultural heritage that just spoke about, with archives, with works of art, with collections, how to preserve them, how to make sure they stay in the region, how to exhibit them, um, and to truly reconsider the legacy of the NAM in the sphere of art and culture today, more radical measures would need to be considered, not only in a declarative, but on the practical, um, but on the practical applicative levels, on the level of governance, on the level of knowledge production, and as already mentioned, on heritage. And this is something that we discuss a lot also within seminars and conferences that are happening on the topic of NAM. Uh, but this, uh, this, Applicative level, this has be is becoming increasingly difficult to do, uh, especially in Slovenia now, in the current political situation where the right conservatives, Minister of Culture included, openly oppose and uh, even verbally attack all, all of us that are working, researching, and doing exhibition with Yugoslav and non aligned topics in heritage. So, um, for the end, um, perhaps we should also learn elsewhere, for example, in Bolivia also a NAM member, where recently the new Ministry of Cultures, Decolonization and Depatriarchalization was established with Sabina Orellana Cruz, Akecha, its minister. I'm finished, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Boena, great end. Uh, I will now invite uh, Aida Hordic, Hozic or Hodic, I'm sorry for, for uh, if I don't pronounce it correctly, from the University of Florida to give her comments uh, and reflections. Thanks. Thank you, Ksenia. And it is Hozic. It's, it's not Hozic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, will, uh, I will try to actually just pose questions on the basis of these four absolutely fascinating presentations today. Um, I cannot even begin to be as eloquent as Natasha was in her first commentary um, this morning. Um, and I will try to kind of just highlight some of the issues which I think culture and arts um, and cultural politics in principle um, can help us address which perhaps just purely kind of political or historical um, analysis of NAM um, may not. I think we have already emphasized in a number of presentations thus far that NAM's importance was, was um, in many ways um, in the fact that it generated a very different Im imagery and imaginary um, of the world. Uh, whether it was different geographies, different mappings, um, different st street names, uh, what, it, what does it mean to grow up in a city which has actually a street name by Patrice Lumumba, 
what does it mean to read Leopold Sanger's uh, poems in school, um, which is not necessarily happening um, anymore. Uh, and then obviously this kind of very rich um, visual imaginary. What I think these two papers this afternoon, or these, these two presentations by Liliana and, and Boana um, have emphasized, is also that this kind of visual imaginary did not come out of thin air, that there was a very kind of important material and institutional infrastructure which nurtured and generated that alternative, potentially alternative um, imaginary. So the questions that I think arise here are how lasting, how emancipatory, um, how cross-pollinated truly that imaginary was, or and or to what degree this was just a matter of kind of a circulation of goods uh, through an alternative network without necessarily a very lasting, long-lasting um, impression. Um, so the, the question that Boana kind of ended her presentation with uh, right now of what to do with this archive, what to do uh, with, the, with the imaginary that was constituted through that infrastructure which no longer perhaps exists, um, is really, I think, critical for um, the legacy um, of now. So yesterday, Kola Kilibarde in our chat when we were talking about the Asia um, in Europe, um, mentioned something that I think is really, once again, can, can be a fruitful point of departure uh, for the conversations about these visual imaginaries. And Kola said that, that actually what was important about Nam was that it was not just a rejection of bipolarity, but that it was also an embrace of decolonization and of progressive developmentalism. So in a certain sense, um, we could also substitute this, this progressive developmentalism with a certain and particular interpretations of modernity. And I think art and culture enable us to think then beyond these geopolitical um, structures uh, that we usually emphasize when thinking about Nam and think more about these bigger processes, about decolonization, about progressive developmentalism, about progressive modernity, and ways in which these two categories actually interact with each other. Hence the question of whether and to what degree um, the creation, the art produced through these, through these processes and through these interactions uh, was truly in any way uh, different than the art that was produced through this kind of, uh, in, in alliance with the Western modernist hegemonic um, canon. Um, and then also, whether or not um, this was only really, these processes were really only state driven through these state created infrastructures, or was there anything else? Were there any other effects that actually exceeded these state driven processes? Um, so, you know, the, the thing which crossed my mind was I was thinking also about Dubravka Sekulic's presentation the other day about the kind of the architectural developments of Energo Project, um, which one could also interpret as kind of a one upmanship uh, in the building of convention centers is who's going to have a bigger and better convention center. Um, so I wonder to what degree arts was also subject to some of this one upmanship um, and, and or to what degree there was kind of a room here uh, for spontaneous and different um, interactions that would happen outside of the state structures and these once again state driven processes. The second question, which I'm also kind of puzzling over, is that this kind of developmental, uh, progressive developmentalism that, that Kola was mentioning, or this progressive modernity, uh, was nonetheless a very violent and a grinding process. Um, so I'm curious about how art and artists actually address that violent nature of modernization uh, to which many citizens in unallied countries were subject um, at the time. Um, and then, you know, final thing, and I will, I'm really kind of being brief here. Uh, I, I wanted to address something that stems from um, Liliana's presentation, but to some degree also um, reflecting on the, on the institutions that Boana was mentioning, um, is this question of kind of the internal inequalities within Yugoslavia and their, and their uh, you know, kind of, and the, and the ability of the non-centers or the non-capitals, non-Ljubljana, non, non Zagreb um, and Belgrade, um, to participate in this um, kind of circulation of, of, of the arts. 
Um, and I wanted to mention that you know Paul was now asking in the in the question in the in the chat of sort of underlining how important these Republican keys were. Yes, Republican keys come from the changes in the in the constitution of Yugoslavia, um, obviously. Uh, but they will also, I think, the greater participation of Sarajevo and Skopje in particular, and then later on even Pristina, uh, were also internally driven. Uh, there was a development of institutions within Skopje, within Sarajevo at the time, openings of the, of the art academies, um, the role of national galleries, the role of the Museum of Modern Art in, um, in Skopje. Also of particular individuals, um, or then Poklevsky, obviously, but then in, in Sarajevo, the role of uh, women curators actually at the National Gallery, and particularly Azra Begic, who, who becomes a, a, a kind of a uh, tremendous promoter of the Bosnian, particularly Bosnian graphic art. And for Bojan, I also wanted to mention that for Sarajevo and for Sarajevo graphic artists, uh, Ljubljana Biennial was really crucial. Uh, but so so was Cairo and so was Krakow. And so there were you know two different kind of places uh, that that very much um, helped in in their um, kind of promotion um, into uh, the on the international on the international scene. Um, so that was basically what I have to say. I think I will I will end there and um, and open the floor to other questions. Thank you very much. I apologize once more for not pronouncing your surname. Uh, well, uh, we uh, I would invite now Yelena and Boena to respond, but also if you uh, would like to include in your response, uh, we have two questions in chat. Uh, um, can I say something? Maybe it's not uh, directly related to what you, Ida, just mentioned and your uh, this wrap up was so compact that I must admit I forgot many questions, but I wanted to point out that one thing that we should be aware that was uh, happening uh, during the time of non-alignment in culture was uh, cultural solidarity. Cultural solidarity networks were very uh, powerful, very much present. And if we think, for example, the example that I mentioned, Chile 71, artists from all over the world donate work of art. And then there was a case of Palestine, and then it was a case of Nicaragua, and then it was a case of Chernagora, Montenegro, and there are many cases like that. And then think today, does this kind of artistic solidarity still exist at all? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, of course, they were also um, things happening in the smaller places outside the center. And the two examples that we spoke about today, it's Slovengradac, which is the town in the north of Slovenia with their pavilion um, established in 57, which also uh, acquired quite some works from the non-aligned artists. And where also things were happening and the big exhibition with presence for many important artists, including the curator uh, from uh, Argentina, Jorge Duzberg. And this is uh, what Sanja Horvatinčić asked. Uh, this is one of the personal connections that I know of. Jorge Luzberg, he was part of the Ljubljana Graphic Biennial, he was part of the jury, and also he was a uh, curator and selector for Slovene Gradets. And of course you have the Titograd case, Titograd is not, was not really on the axis Ljubljana, uh, Zagreb, Sarajevo, Belgrade, but still you have this uh, uh, gallery of the non-aligned where they acquired in a couple of years over a thousand uh, works, donations, the, uh, the, this collection still exists. You can see it from time to time. It's part of the Center, uh, Center for Contemporary Art of Montenegro. So this, I think, is what I wanted to point out. And I think this also answered a little bit Sanya Horvatinci's question. But the way, usually, I can tell from the graphic biennial example, the way the artworks were acquired from the West, um, from the Western part of the world, there was a committee uh, in, the, uh, in the Ljubljana and Moderna Galleria, and this committee was made of very important, prominent male curators from MoMA. There was Harald Zeman, there was Riva Kastelman, and many others, and there was Jorge Duzberg, and there was also the one from Luc Stanislavski. So they made their own selection, kind of like the best works from the West, Paris School, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the way they, they invited the participants from the NAM or even from the Eastern parties, they just sent direct invitation by ambassadors and cultural centers. So they really got a mixture of works from those places and kind of like the best works from the West. 
Okay, responding to your questions very briefly for the first one is uh, uh, the effects of, 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 of cultural, of, of uh, visual arts in, in um, I think that uh, uh, here we have to ha take into account that a lot of Yugoslav cultural program programs were related to UNESCO programs as well. And uh, UNESCO had a, a very particular framework in which it was helping uh, a, a cultural exchange. So I think that it also, the, the UNESCO also very strongly affected the, the, the exchange. And um, in the 18, in 1980 at uh, the, that uh, uh, round series of round tables discussing the, the role of culture in development, uh, um, uh, the delegate from Senegal is uh, uh, pointing out the influence of uh, UNESCO on cultural exchange as limiting. And uh, uh, he's uh, asking for the changes in the approach to, to African cultures uh, uh, within the framework of UNESCO. And I think it's a very important observation because uh, uh, in a series of discussions that were held at that point and that were recording in the, in the journal magazine Cultura in the 80s, you will find the same objections to the workings of the international organizations. Um, the, the, the other question I think was uh, 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 what has changed by the greater participation of other republics in the in the practices of cultural exchange, um, I think that it was interesting that, uh, except for for the influence of the key of the republic key, there were also interventions by the non-aligned countries themselves. So, in the 1975, Algier and Tunisia asked to establish the um, cultural exchange with Bosnia being well, uh, well informed about uh, its Muslim heritage, which would be direct, not mediated by, the, by any commission or any federal body, which is the first such request uh, that I have encountered. Um, and um, um, I, uh, 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 relating to, to, to that uh, networks and, and uh, um, positions of certain manifestations in Yugoslavia in, reconnect, in connecting and, and, and networking with non-aligned countries and the situation at, at in Yugoslavia. I'm really astonished that uh, in uh, a number of accounts and texts that were written, or but at least those that I have read uh, about Ljubljana uh, uh, Biennale, uh, do, do not mention the real reason why it was established. And it was, I think it's very important for understanding the relations in, in Yugoslav cultural scene. It was established as a reaction to the centralization of the cultural circulation by Belgrade. And a few very important exhibitions missed Ljubljana and Ljubljana was protesting such policy. Uh, and uh, uh, is, is it, there wasn't any substantial or important response on behalf of the commission from Belgrade. They simply started to support by their own means the exchange first with Austria and then with Italy. And uh, through, through those three few exhibitions that were, <clears throat> that were actually uh, uh, organized under Karol Dobida, who was at that time, it, it, before 1955, director of the Modern Gallery, that was the, the birthplace of the idea of the graphic Biennale. And that, so it was not intended and it was not established uh, as a, some kind of a forerunner of Yugoslav non-aligned uh, cultural policy, but as a kind of the resistance to the centralization of Yugoslav cultural space, which I think is very important because it was, it was established and the first uh, issue was run without the help of the Commission for Cultural Exchange by the, by the means of the Slovenian Republic. And then only later on, it was included in a big way in the, in the, in the uh, exchange with non countries, but was very important for changing the relations at the domestic art scene. And it was followed with some 
other very important exhibitions or, or, or organized at other locations in, in Yugoslavia. So it was, it, it also was in a kind revolutionary in regard to the local settings. And I don't know which was the last question. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I'm direct, <clears throat> uh, if there was a, uh, yeah, the only, the only attempt in organizing exchange uh, um, uh, beyond the, 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 the commission or, or the council for cultural exchange that I know of is the attempt of uh, Želimir Koscevic to bring to Zagreb a very important exhibition by the um, Buenos Aires Skyk, that is by Jorge Glusberg, uh, Glusberg was traveling through uh, uh, socialist, uh, uh, European socialist countries at the beginning of the 70s, and they met in 1973. Kosevich went to, to uh, um, Buenos Aires, and they, uh, uh, they made an agreement that uh, they, the Yugoslav uh, artists will uh, exhibit in, in the Kaik Center, and the uh, Argentinian ones will exhibit in Zagreb. <clears throat> you know, it was before. The, the, the dictatorship, so the, that exhibition that was supposed to be shown in Zagreb was organized in 1975 in Paris. And it was really, really interesting and, and really socially engaged, but I don't know if it has reached Yugoslavia, but it was made completely out of this framework of official. But when it was uh, almost brought to the realization, the commission entered in and uh, uh, was, putting it uh, or including it into its program of exchange. But from that moment on, there are no other documents describing the, the, the final results. So I don't know if exhibition reached Zagreb and if it, it didn't, why it didn't. But uh, uh, concerning its structure and, 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 uh, and the, and the idea behind the uh, uh, entire exhibition, it uh, was very, very close to that, uh, uh, culture of revolution and resistance that was very particular for La uh, Latin America in the end, end of the 60s and the 70s. Can I say something? Uh, I, I see there are some other colleagues here who has also written extensively on non-alignment and non-aligned cultures and other things related to contemporaneity, like Jelena Besic, uh, Anthony Gardner, Anna Sladojevic, maybe they have something to say about that because it's a similar topic. Okay, uh, we are now uh, running out of time. I would say uh, we have one raised hand. Uh, if you agree, I would give a word to Poyana. Paul, is it okay to, uh, I mean, I'm asking you, I can- I'm just enjoying myself, just, keep, yeah. just do what you like. I would suggest that uh, we say maybe officially the day is over. Who has to go, uh, you can go, but then I will uh, uh, ask Boana to ask her question and uh, who, I mean, we can stay and discuss together further. Boana. Ah, thanks. Um, it's maybe just a comment on what was said earlier on the infrastructural questions and institutional questions around Ljubljana and and other um, and other exhibitions. Uh, one of the things that I keep coming back to in my own research, but in just thinking about this stuff, is that um, when Ljubljana started in 1955, this was only 10 years after World War II ended in Yugoslavia. Um, already 1946, artists are basically without materials to work. Uh, that means that they're writing uh, that they need help because they don't have paint to paint with. Um, so the devastation of cultural and any other institutions really was quite dire. Not in all, not in the entire Yugoslavia, of course. And one of the one of the things that maybe we can, you know, discuss further is this uneven development because the the republics that had more institutional um, institutional institutions of art, which were uh, Slovenia and uh, Croatia, were definitely at uh, at an advantage over some who are um, 
let's say like Bosnia or Macedonia that had no uh, almost none, uh, no institutions. Um, so um, there is that too, the material kind of um, uh, basis for the construction of art, which was quite difficult. Um, and so th the artists and those who were in the art uh, institutions, working curators, uh, were all content, were all having to uh, basically deal with a difficult situation, material situation. So that was it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, as I said, uh, I, I would like to thank you all. The official part uh, is over, but.